What does it mean to live a moral life? How do we perform and relate to our duties? These are questions that are asked in the course of almost any human life, and they are indeed some of the most important questions humans can ask about their lives. But despite their seemingly commonplace character, these very questions are also able to provide the fuel for some of the most rarefied philosophical excursions. G.W.F. Hegel's notoriously difficult Phenomenology of Spirit tackles these questions from within his philosophical framework. What he finds is that the moral consciousness, made up of commitments such as the commitment to universal duty, which may be initially unquestioned, is beset with a range of confusions and contradictions. The actual practice of daily life that carries out its given specific duties remains far away from the resolute purity of the moral consciousness. Morality is vexed by its conflicting commitments. We are not sure whether the commitment to our country takes precedence over our commitment to the world community. We weigh whether it is reasonable to sacrifice the interests of groups or individuals in order to attain various moral ideals. Hegel finds that it is the phenomenon of conscience that is able to resolve the acute division between theory and practice, between the actual consciousness that is able to function and perform deeds in the world, and the moral consciousness which insists on its own principles. Conscience provides a voice of clarity and action that supersedes morality's difficulties. First, we will examine the tensions and contradictions in the moral consciousness, which conscience eventually supersedes. Morality for Hegel is the shape of consciousness inhabited by self-consciousness that is supremely aware of the fact that rational moral consideration and acting towards moral purposes are the highest considerations. It arises from the previous development of absolute freedom, another shape of consciousness in which the universal will, guided by a commitment to enlightenment over faith, manifests its utmost power to remake the world in the name of the universal going so far as to overturn any particular social structures that stand in its way. At its utmost extent, it even unleashes terror on the world. After this frightening development, it is found that, quote, spirit refreshes itself, unquote, in the pure deliberations of the moral consciousness. But even if absolute freedom is the preceding step before the turn to morality, the foundation of morality is in self-consciousness, it knows its own essence, being keenly aware of the movements of its own consciousness. But it is also aware of the external other to itself, namely, the outside world of objects and other self-consciousnesses that it interacts with. Hegel notes that, quote, self-consciousness knows duty to be the absolute essence, unquote. The otherness that self-consciousness is in relation to becomes an entire complex of phenomena, including, quote, a self-subsistent whole of laws, an independent operation of those laws, and a free realization of them, unquote, which Hegel terms nature. The point here is that while self-consciousness is committed to duty, it also finds a world of nature that is not beholden to the same commitment and appears to follow its own rules and inclinations. But the moral consciousness proper discovers that this nature which includes the natural, non-moral part of the self, in addition to the outer worlds of human culture and truly organic nature, is in fact indifferent to its projects. For moral consciousness, quote, duty is the essence, unquote, but nature is free from such considerations. Nature is unconcerned with bestowing on moral consciousness the satisfaction of either action or the happiness of the fulfillment of moral action. Quote, Nature perhaps may let it become happy, or perhaps may not. Unquote. The non moral consciousness sees the opportunity for realization, but the moral consciousness finds only quote, cause for complaint. Unquote. We can see this for ourselves in a performance of moral actions. In certain cases, there can be fulfillment derived from taking moral actions, but just as often, there is no internal or external reward for doing what the moral consciousness sees as right. We thus derive a notion of pure duty, which is the absolute purpose of moral action separated from the promise of happiness. Despite this separation found between morality and nature, 
consciousness attempts to postulate that there is no difference, that the two entities are in fact in harmony. Nature presents itself in the individual consciousness through sensuousness and natural instincts and inclinations. Morality requires the pure thought of duty for its own purpose. Pure thought finds this impossible to reconcile with sensuousness, however, and the only solution it can see is to eliminate the sensuous element. But both sensuousness and pure thought are aspects of the same underlying consciousness, and therefore, quote, we have to be content with expressing the unity by saying that sensuousness should be in conformity with morality, unquote. Consciousness postulates this harmony and works to bring it about. But the ultimate fulfillment is impossible. If such a harmony were to be attained, there would be no need for moral consciousness to actually do the work of defining and insisting on duty, for that would be already given in the harmony between morality and nature, or everything else that exists. It is thus indefinitely postponed. The task of morality, then, is a Sisyphean labor of striving to better itself against the indifference of nature. This task of endless labor against nature is made no easier by the fact that the task of morality is not simply known and given, but rather morality has internal debates and tensions. Duty has initially been discussed as a singular object, but while the consideration of duty can be considered as a singular entity, Consciousness is in fact presented with a multitude of specific duties, some of them contradictory. One has a duty to one's priest, spouse, children, employer, and nation, and each of them may be asking for things that pull in contradictory directions. The moral consciousness is inclined to adhere to pure duty, which as discussed earlier is separate from the consideration of happiness, but is also separate from all specific contents. But the specific duties demand their own action and satisfaction. There thus arises, quote, another consciousness which makes them sacred, unquote. This, quote, master and ruler of the world, unquote, sanctifies the specific duties and makes it possible for the normal consciousness to attend to them and carry them out. Stephen Holgate argues that this other consciousness is the human consciousness's postulation of God. In my view, this could also be the voice of social authority, like the judgments of the work supervisor, government, or social media consensus, which in our more secular age serves the role of the sanctifying element for the variety of specific duties that humans are tasked with carrying out. Because it is impossible to actually live life according to the high dictates of the moral consciousness, there comes to be a split between the moral consciousness and the actual consciousness, which carries out the actual tasks and duties of normal life. For the actual consciousness, pure duty is not sacred itself, but is sacred instead, quote, only immediately, unquote. It knows that it is not as perfect as the moral consciousness, and that its resources are comparatively, quote, imperfect and contingent, unquote. Therefore, it cannot expect happiness as a result of its actions as the moral consciousness can. Its happiness comes as it will, the action of a higher grace. Morality then sees that its task is the unity of itself with nature, quote, the final purpose of the world, unquote. But it also understands that this task does not come with the power and mastery to actually carry it out. It is thus led to the conclusion that, quote, there is no moral, perfect, actual self-consciousness, unquote. Such a state might be possible in a beyond, or in the imagination, but not in the actual moral consciousness of life. But this contradiction between morality and life cannot stand, and thus we are led to the examination of the concept of dissemblance. The basic problem of dissemblance comes in the very structure of the moral consciousness, as Hegel explains in section 616. The moral consciousness sees an object in front of it, implicitly duty, which is not stated in the text, and it attains its peace and satisfaction in attaining it and not going beyond that object. However, that very consciousness must at the same time place the object outside and beyond itself. This is a structural contradiction that leads in human moral consciousness to the psychological experience we know as dissemblance, or feigning to hold a moral position that one does not truly hold. Let us unpack this idea further with some scenarios. 
The first example Hegel gives of this dissemblance has to do with the possibility of fulfillment of morality through action. The moral consciousness postulates the harmony of morality in nature, as discussed earlier. In other words, it provisionally entertains it as true, while also acknowledging that it is unproven and thus may not be true. Indeed, in a certain sense, it thinks that it is not actually true in reality. The moral consciousness must take action to fulfill its purpose, and that purpose is understood as bringing morality and nature into unity. But in so doing, it shows that it does not regard the harmony of morality and nature as a mere postulate, but as something really true. Hegel notes that, quote, action, therefore, in fact, directly fulfills what was asserted could not take place, unquote. That is, consciousness proclaims through action that it is not in earnest making the postulate. In another example, if nature is known to have its own laws separate from duty, it is known that duty cannot be realized within nature, and therefore, by acting in accordance with duty, we are not truly concerned with the fulfillment of duty as the purpose of our action. This is because the only thing that is truly fulfilled and thus fulfillable is the laws of nature or reality, and thus we are dissembling in pretending that duty can be fulfilled. In a final attempt to escape these contradictions, moral consciousness again seeks refuge in another consciousness, this time in the, quote, holy moral lawgiver, unquote, which attempts to give a pure and unimpeachable source for morality. But the moral consciousness dissembles here too, because it is not truly capable of delegating its positions to another consciousness, as, quote, the moral self-consciousness is its own absolute, unquote. These contradictions will be overcome by conscience, the next shape of consciousness Hegel examines. Morality, as we have seen, has several inherent flaws. First, it is unable to realize its own project, as it is forever tasked with maintaining itself against the impossibility of nature. Second, it is unable to act on the specific duties that are required in human life, holding out for pure duty which is never realized, and relegating action to a separate actual consciousness. Third, it is unable to tell the difference in priority between one duty and another. Fourth, the structural contradictions inherent in the way morality relates to duty lead it to a dissemblance, in which its actions which supposedly try to be moral are in fact feigned. Conscience is the shape of consciousness that is able to deal with all of these problems of morality. Hegel defines conscience as, quote, spirit that is directly aware of itself as absolute truth and being, unquote. It works through concrete, immediate action. It, quote, fulfills not this or that duty, but knows and does what is concretely right, unquote. Conscience thus deals with the problems of morality as follows. First, as regards the impossibility of fulfilling morality against the indifference of nature, conscience does not conceptualize its duty as something separate from nature, it simply acts on the duty that seems right to it, regardless of nature. It is not possible to speak of the fulfillment of the entire project of conscience, and thus it leaves nothing outstanding to fulfill against nature. Second, with regards to the inability to act on the specific duties required of human life, conscience has its emphasis on simple and concrete action, as opposed to the moral consciousness, which is preoccupied with ideal duty in contrast to acting on specific duties. Third, with regard to morality's inability to tell the difference between duties, conscience does not deliberate between duties, but simply acts on the one that calls out to its conviction. Fourth, conscience does not dissemble because it does not need to hold duty out in front of itself as an ideal object that can never be fulfilled, but instead acts simply on what seems right to it that is given to it. With these key resolutions to the moral consciousness's issues, Conscience supersedes moral consciousness. Hegel wrote about morality and conscience just after the Enlightenment, when traditional moral structures and duties were overthrown with the goal of establishing the reign of enlightened reason. It is therefore possible to argue that one should be wary of comparisons to accounts from other times and places with different ideals of rationality and rational argumentation. But one could also argue that Hegel was interrogating psychological structures that if not absolutely constant through time, have enough of an underlying basis to make comparison fruitful.
In this spirit, I will examine an episode from the Bhagavad Gita in order to argue that the structure of conscience that Hegel develops is actually structurally similar to what we find in an allegorical reading of the Gita. The Gita was written in approximately the 2nd century BCE in India as a section from a longer epic called the Mahabharata. It deals with an episode in the life of Arjuna, a warrior, and the incarnated god Krishna. Arjuna is faced with a battle, and he does not want to fight because of a feeling of dejection and moral confusion. Krishna reveals to him the true significance of his action and expounds on a path of yoga, or spiritual discipline. This text has resonated in India, and increasingly the world, for its examination of the nature of dharma, a concept from Indian philosophy which can be seen as an analog for the concept of duty. As we discussed earlier in this essay, the moral consciousness is troubled by how indifferent nature is to it. It sees only, quote, an occasion for acting, unquote, but not the opportunity for fulfillment and achievement. That is, it sees only the possibility for pure duty. This is Arjuna's experience as he contemplates the battle. His initial understanding of his role as a warrior is just pure duty. The war he is participating in is a war between families, and those slain on the other side would be his family members. He recoils from the idea of slaying these relatives on the battlefield, so pure duty is not tenable for him. The moral consciousness then sets up a, quote, master and ruler of the world, unquote, who sanctifies duties. Krishna's voice initially encourages him to fight, speaking as the voice of pure duty and social authority, but this still isn't enough to convince Arjuna to fight. Hegel's morality eventually comes to the realization that moral actuality in the world is impossible. Duty always holds, but there is always the impossibility of harmony with nature or moral fulfillments. This causes the rise of dissemblance. Even though moral actuality is impossible, the moral consciousness finds this unbearable and starts to seek for morality in an otherworldly beyond. There is a moment of this tendency towards otherworldly fulfillments in Arjuna's dissatisfaction. Quote from the Bhagavad Gita, These I do not wish to slay, even if I myself am slain, not even for the kingdom of the three worlds, how much less for a kingdom of the earth. Unquote. Arjuna here preaches a moral purity that goes even beyond heaven. We see that this intense contradiction faced by the moral consciousness in Hegel is very much like the contradiction faced by Arjuna. For Hegel, we see a partial resolution in the idea of conscience. Conscience is the self that realizes actuality and harmony, that reconciles duty and action. It is the pure action of righteousness without the complexity of moral dilemma. I argue that we can read the voice of Krishna allegorically as shifting to the voice of conscience. Krishna first speaks to Arjuna in the mode of pure duty, appealing to Arjuna's social role, but eventually he provides the divine revelation that this is a righteous war and that it is indeed the highest duty to fight. In doing so, he cuts through the complexity of Arjuna's moral dilemmas and shows him what must be done. Rather than viewing this as a call to perform social duties unfailingly, which is a common interpretation, yogi and commentator Sri Aurobindo reads this as the call of God that goes beyond all socially conditioned dharmas, and that each one needs to listen for what is that voice of Krishna for himself. Therefore, its function is quite similar to conscience in Hegel. Conscience is a powerful shape of consciousness, one that allows Hegel's phenomenological subject to cut through the complexities of weighing moral duties, just as it allows Arjuna to see through his dejection to see that the war is a righteous one. Morality follows freedom and holds rationally contemplated ideal duty in its mind as a star by which it navigates the world, but it finds itself unable to act and gets lost in the sea of dissemblance when it does. Conscience remedies these defects with its simple, immediate action. But conscience is not the end of the development in Hegel. We come to see that conscience cannot provide absolute knowledge of what is the right duty, or knowledge of consequences, even though its voice is clear and strong. One solution to this is presented in the Gita. Action is the thing that must be done, but doesn't guarantee any particular outcome, whether good or evil, and one must be prepared to deal with any outcome in spiritual equality. Hegel seems to come to a similar conclusion when he says, quote, There is, then, no more talk of good intentions coming to nothing, 
or of the good man faring badly. On the contrary, the duty that is known to be such is fulfilled and becomes a reality, just because what is essentially a duty is the universal for all self-consciousnesses, is that which is recognized and acknowledged and thus positively is.